I'm going to speak, and I have to apologize in advance, I'm going to speak at length. Uh, I am told these days that the uh, thesis is that nobody can retain attention for more than three minutes. So if you speak for more than three minutes, you lose the audiences. So I'm sp going to speak much longer than three minutes, and I shall reduce you to a lumbering heap. <laughs> but that cannot be helped, because there are certain things that I wish to say, and they need to be said. I'm not a very good reader. I prepared a speech. Every now and then, I try not to read and speak directly to you. But certain things I shall read so as to keep to the straight and narrow that I think must be, must be conveyed. Comrades, over the past few years, the imperialist bourgeoisie has intensified its efforts to falsify history by maligning the achievements of communism, while at the same time hiding the crimes committed by imperialism. In particular, the attempt is being made to equate communism with fascism. The so-called Prague Declaration recently circulated in the European Parliament under the title of European Conscience and Communism is precisely such an example of the attempt to equate Soviet communism with Hitlerite fascism in an echo of the reactionary writings of Robert Conquest and George Orwell. The recent release of the film Katyn by the reactionary Polish filmmaker Andrzej Wodia regarding the alleged massacre of Polish officers by the Red Army in 1940 is in the same vein. In an outrageous misinterpretation of history, it's repeatedly asserted that the Soviet German non-aggression pact of 23rd of August 1939 was nothing short of Soviet collusion, collusion with Hitler. And th these are the words of, of the uh, economist of a year ago. The Kremlin should admit that Stalin was Hitler's accomplice before 1941. Now, it's done, of course, this kind, these kinds of sentences are written to a mixture of ignorance, malice, and straightforward, fraudulent lie. Because you do not work for the Economist or the Financial Times or any of the bourgeois papers, and your wallet, wallet stuffed with the loot that imperialism gets from all over the world without telling lies on behalf of imperialism. And I shall, I shall endeavor to show that this is nothing but a fraudulent lie. <coughs> This is, this is what, what it said. Of course, the economist, as you would expect, conveniently forgot that driven by a visceral hatred of the Socialist Soviet Union, Britain and France had, a year before the German-Soviet non-aggression pact, <coughs> on 30th of September 1938, signed the Munich Agreement with Hitler, which practically handed the fate of Czechoslovakia to Nazi Germany. And you have seen pictures of Nathan Chamberlain coming with a piece of paper and saying, uh, peace, 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 peace in our time. Now, that was not just a capitulation to the uh, Nazis in Germany. It was more than that. Czechoslovakia had been handed as a down payment in order to encourage Hitlerite Germany to go east, look east and attack the Soviet Union. The purpose being twofold. One, to weaken German imperialism, a rival imperialist part, and B, to put an end to the Soviet Union as a socialist country and reintegrate it into the world, world, world cap capitalist system. Now, the economists in writing that just managed to forget, forget, of course, in quotation marks, some of the facts. On the 1st of January 1970, when some secret foreign office files were made public by the expiry of the statutory 30 years, The Guardian, published from the same city as The Economist, and probably its office not very far away from The Guardian's offices, stated the following. The cabinet papers for 1939, published this morning, show that the Second World War would not have started that year had Chamberlain government accepted or understood the Russian advice that an alliance between Britain, France, and Soviet Union would prevent the war because Hitler would not risk a conflict against powers on two fronts. That's The Guardian. And The Guardian is not writing itself through journalistic uh, uh, inspiration, it's writing on the basis of the papers of the Foreign Office that were released after a 30-year statutory period. <coughs> Anthony Eden, who at one time was the Foreign Minister of, of Great Britain and subsequently became the Prime Minister and had to, uh, to resign after a humiliating fiasco of the Suez War in 1956. This is what Anthony Eden said. Hardly anyone could doubt that had the alliance between Russia, Britain, and the United States 
which was established at Yalta. Yalta took place after, after Stalingrad. Had, had it been formed in 1939, the war would have never taken place. That's Anthony Eden. A French general called Andre Gouffre had this to say. He observed, when one, when one reads today the draft of the Anglo-French Soviet Treaty, one cannot help thinking how blind and petty-minded our diplomacy must have been in solving this problem that it could miss the opportunity to conclude so important a treaty. That's a French general. The reason was, of course, clear, as I have made uh, clear in my <coughs> earlier remarks. And the reason it was eloquently stated after the Soviet Union had been attacked by the Nazis by a certain senator called Senator Harry S. Truman, who subsequently was to become the, Prime Minister, uh, the President of the United States of America after the death of President Franklin D. D. Roosevelt. What does he say on the day that the Soviet Union is attacked? Day after the Soviet Union is attacked, he says, well, if we see that Germany is winning, we should help the Russians. And if Russia is winning, we should help Germany. And that way, we let them kill as many as they possibly could. <laughs> now, if you go around, you're told constantly that Britain and America fought in the cause of fighting against fascism for the freedom of nations. They're not fighting for the freedom of nations. Somebody who was to become the president of the United States of America, he says, if Russia is winning, we should help the Germans. I, we, should, we should support the fascists. If, on the other hand, it's the other way around, then we should support the Russians. The idea is to kill two enemies at the same time, a, ger a rival imperialist power from Germany and, of course, the Soviet, so, 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 Soviet Union. Comrades, when we are discussing this, it's not about the past. The interpretation of history has a bearing on the future. Those who are bent upon denying the working class and the oppressed people the bright future are equally bent upon distorting and falsifying the, the history of the working class. When we fight for our history, we're not just fighting for our past. If the October Revolution had nothing to do with the future, it was just the past, it just would not be worthwhile remembered. It would just be something that some people had a, a, an obscure interest in. The October Revolution is celebrated because it continues to be a point of inspiration and a rallying point for the oppressed people and the proletarians of the world to overthrow the wretched system which drowns <coughs> in blood millions and millions of, of people every year and every decade and every century and it's got to be got rid of. <laughs> Why is this anti-communist terrain being launched precisely at, at this moment? Why is it they, they constantly are trying to say communism is dead? Well, if it's dead, what's the point of talking about it? <laughs> I mean, if I came to you and I said Napoleon is dead, you'd laugh in my face. You'd think he'd gone mad. Everybody knows Napoleon is dead. What's the point of saying every morning Napoleon is dead? Well, if communism is still dead, what's the point of every radio, every newspaper, every bourgeois television station announcing every day Marxism is dead? Precisely because it's not dead. Precisely because it does not let the bourgeoisie sleep easy. Precisely because it continues to disturb the peace of mind of the bourgeoisie, they've got to constantly assure themselves, no, communism is dead. These people, instead of saying communism is dead, they need to see their shrinks. They need to go and see their psychiatrists to cure them of the melody that they are suffering from, which melody they cannot avoid in their late day, because their future is in the past and not, not in the future. Our future is lying ahead of us, and we have every reason to be cheerful about the future. <laughs> <laughs>